Welcome to the Amplifying Scientific Innovation Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sophia Onoye Onye, founder and CEO of the Sophia Consulting Firm, a life science marketing and communications consultancy that was established in New York City with the goal of amplifying scientific innovation. The goal of this podcast is to showcase scientific innovation stemming from global life science companies prior to and following COVID-19 from the perspectives of founders, CEOs, and other senior executives who are working on the development of transformative life-saving solutions for patients. My guest today is Dr. Joseph Garacci, co-founder and CEO of Metromark Corp, a sci-tech company that utilizes next-generation machine learning or ML technologies to extract unknown insight about patient populations with the dual goal of optimizing clinical trials and creating a new taxonomy of disease in order to better understand how to repurpose drugs and create new therapeutics. Joe holds a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, Physics, Neuroscience, and Philosophy from the University of Toronto, Victoria University. In addition, he holds a Master's Degree in Pure Mathematics and a PhD in Applied Mathematics from the University of Toronto. And as if that's not impressive enough, Joe also holds a PhD in Mathematical Physics from the University of Southern California. Joe and I met at the 2019 Collaboration for Novel Solutions or CNS Summit during his poster presentation. I was highly impressed by his knowledge of machine learning and his distinct passion for the novel explainable machine learning paradigm that his company created that is called Netra AI. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thank you, great to be here. <laughs> So my first question, in my opinion, is the most important. What is your definition of scientific innovation? Well, it's changed, right? Because academically, scientific innovation is, you know, these little incremental uh, advances that we make on other people's work, right? So we, we go to conferences and say, hey, look what we did. Uh -huh. But what ended up happening was uh, I learned about, I learned that that was boring for me. I wanted to make these big leaps. I wanted to say, hey, there might be a deeper sense. So mm -hmm. to me, it depends whether you're speaking academically or not. I mean, you know, academically, what happens is when the time is right and, and people are in the right place, these yeah. massive advancements take place, of course. Yes. But, yeah. you know, so I think I think these incremental advances are great. But mm -hmm. when it comes to, you know, the startup world and mm -hmm. Silicon Valley and, you know, mm -hmm. all this stuff, I believe that scientific innovation has to do with these leaps that open up the way we approach markets. That's mm -hmm. what I, I think uh, mm -hmm. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it got a new way to see a disease, you know, mm -hmm. which is what's something that's been, uh, you know, I, I've had a lot of passion for, right? Understanding exactly why right. patients are responding. We'll get into that later. Right. I think that that's wonderful. From what I understand from you, I, I actually ha have the same philosophy that you can think about innovation as a white space, whether it's in a crowded disease space or in a niche disease space or a niche market, it's just really about finding those sort of known unknowns, so to speak. So I agree with you on that. Now, I'm curious though, what is your most notable accomplishment pre-CEO? You happen to have a few, but just if you could pick one or two, that would be great. So one of the things I'm most proud of is is when I was quite young, I started working on quantum gravity. And the approach I took there was interesting because I started messing with the actual like mm. space time that we live in to make mm. to make it you know make it all work. But I mean that that was never published. Actually I have something out there now that was ah. put out recently. But but really the real thing that I think I'm most proud of though is it's hidden inside the work I did at the University of Southern California on quantum mm. computation. And hidden inside that work, and, uh, and one guy from India, wow. he was smart enough to see it. He called me. He saw it. In, hidden in there, what I did is I actually started exploring what are the outer limits that's possible algorithmically hmm. with, with, you know, like what's possible with an algorithm? What are the absolute outer limits, right? Like, right. you know, what can we actually solve? if you had access to quantum resources, I even considered crazy stuff. Like if, you, if I had access to a black hole, what? what can I do with a black hole? Right. Yeah. Like if I, you know, I can, what kind of computation can I do? But so what I did was I started figuring out, I honed in and made it realistically. I didn't think I was going to be able to grow a, a, a little black hole in my backyard. <laughs> so what I did was I focused on 
these problems that quantum computation will one, one day be able to address. And I think these are going to, the potential is that it can change the way we see materials and the way we see medicine, right? patient populations, and anyway, so much complex systems. So that's, I think, my, my biggest accomplishment is lying on the beach in Los Angeles <laughs> and figuring out these outer limits of algorithms, right? Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, that's your brilliance right there. I, I don't know if a lot of people will be thinking that at a beach in California, but that's your brilliance. Um, so now I'm curious, uh, can you provide like a top line overview of uh, potential or ongoing work that you might be doing that is related to immunotherapy or anti-infectives? I would love to hear more. Yeah, sure. So I'm not going to address anti-infectives, but I, I will address immunotherapies. Okay. Because it's something that we're really, really focused on. And I'm happy to get this opportunity to talk about yeah. it with you. So what it is is this, is immunotherapies in cancer, I think, have been great. And, and I'm very lucky. I'm, I'm collaborating with groups uh, like Portage, who are particularly focused on checkpoint inhibitors and all that. But mm -hmm. all the exciting stuff, let me boil it down to the exciting stuff. I've been working on a technology that has the resolution, it has the machine intelligence capable of actually seeing a clean difference between two individuals at that level. And from, from an immuno... Um, from an immunotherapy mm -hmm. perspective, mm -hmm. each of us are unique in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. So you need that kind of resolution. So now we're just starting to introduce this because I've had to, you know, like you were saying about innovation, we had to innovate slowly yeah. and convince yeah. people. Yeah. Now I'm ready to show people. The f so this is what we were able to do. We were able to, at the single patient level, predict that somebody was going to have a heart attack um, or have an adverse reaction on a drug. It's at that pinpoint, and that's when wow. I saw that happening. Wow. Because our ML is not based on neural networks and all that. I mean, we lose all that, but we have something unique. We're able to get in and have that resolution that is going to allow us, with work, to bring this kind of precision me medicine and cancer uh, to the fore. Uh, so that's, that's what the Natra AI is that? Yeah, actually. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to know if that's the Netra AI technology that you're describing. Yeah. So the Netra AI, I think you've seen some of it, but yeah. the Netra AI allows you to, so what it does is you give it some direction, right? Like I was telling you, it's kind of like an unruly child. It'll learn too much, right? But if you give it some direction, what it'll do is it will establish the relationships amongst all the patients, extract all the subpopulations, but you can actually zoom in. And it's like a multi-level system. That's what disease starts to look like to me, mm. right? It looks like that there's, there's hierarchies, right? So for example, in Alzheimer's, which is a great example because of the complexity, you can actually see that there's these stories within stories. And some mm. patients get to dimension ways differently than others. Mm -hmm. And then with, immuno, you know, with these uh, immunotherapies, mm -hmm. what's going to have to happen is we're going to be able to recognize, hey, this person is a lot like this individual who responded. So we have that visualization that clinicians will really love right. and be able to work with. So we have that. We have that now, and now we're just trying to push that forward. I think that that's wonderful. Um, and we talked about this offline, but I would like to learn more about how COVID-19 has changed the way that you work internally. Yeah, COVID-19 uh, was very <laughs> difficult for me because we, yeah. we lost a lot of... Uh, committed funds but you know we we stabilized so the first thing that happened was i sent everybody home and uh we were already pretty good at communicating offline yeah so this was an opportunity for us to uh to just settle in and uh and 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 to begin to work but you know one of the main challenges was clinical trials started to slow down uh but we have gotten attention from the groups who are doing COVID clinical trials. So we've adapted there. And, you know, to be honest, a medical student called me up and said, hey, what can we do with your fancy million dollar machine, right? <laughs> and, and so I said, here, use it. We, we don't yeah. have COVID samples, but we have immunocompromised people. And so he figured out an interesting uh, repurposing that, that complements the usual uh, IL-6 type of efforts. But anyway, I won't get into that. But anyway, that's, that's basically we, we're all learning how to, how to work from home. And we're going to probably change our, our workspace. I'm probably going to reduce our size and go to a place where I found that has boardrooms and stuff where people can rotate and not come in every day. 
Yeah. So yeah, we're adapting it now. Like in like you know, operationally that's how we've adapted. Well, thank you for your honesty. I, I think that it's very important to highlight the financial impact that small companies like yours have experienced, but it's also important to highlight how you've adapted to that. Like the fact that Facebook, Twitter, and a few of these other companies are providing a permanent work from home option for their employees, it's important. And for you, it might also be a cost reduction technique as well, because you don't have to pay so much for so much office space anymore. No, it's, it's true. And, and what it was able to teach me, you know, after the three days of depression I told you about, and I, you know, put my pants back on and went at it, right? Um, I, uh, you know, we were, we managed to stabilize and because there's people that some good angels came on and, and uh, but, but in terms of work, yeah, we have to learn how to work. Uh, we have to be prepared because these type of pandemics can happen. Yeah. Right. And um, yeah. Okay, well, you sort of alluded to this earlier when you mentioned this partner with a medical student, but I'd like to learn more about how your corporate social responsibility efforts have changed as a result of the pandemic. So, I mean, I'm extremely focused with what we're focusing on, which is, you know, with what Netramark is focusing on, which is complex diseases like neurodegeneration and aging and, right. okay, and cancer, of course. Um, but, but uh, like, it's what I did was first I I wrote that paper with with the student right and we got a lot of attention from that which was great but the other thing that we did was uh, we ended up joining a large pharma company uh, offered to support us we haven't gotten any financial support from the government yet but we're looking into it and we spoke to people at the Gates Foundation so we're looking into it, but this is what this is what I proposed I have this technology that's really good at explaining uh, complex populations of patients, it's, you know, and, and the heterogeneity and finding the Achilles heel. So my thought was, look, if I had, and I'm, we're able to work with small data. So if we had some yeah. money to get some RNA seq, what I offered everybody was this, uh, to take the data, mm -hmm. we'll create our Netra maps. And mm -hmm. because it's such an easy interactive tool, I'll create a public facing uh, interface. It's already exists. It's just a password I give to everybody. And scientists can go on and actually extract um, and, and learn about the heterogeneity themselves and they can, they, they're free to publish uh, what they find, just refer to us, right? And, yeah. and, and I think this is extremely important because there's young people who are having strokes and then there's older people who are having nothing, right? Yeah. What is the, what are the, we need to understand the machinery because right. this is not only going to inform this, but it's going to inform our next, our next pandemic. Right. No, I think that that's very well said. And my next question, once again, you alluded to it earlier, just around the need for increased data, data exchange, like information exchange. It shouldn't just be limited to one group of people. Right. So what are some other key consideration factors that you think will be important in order for us to sustain innovation in the life science industry? I think that... I, I think that we're doing a good job. I think that entrepreneurs... Our, and the partnerships with academia yeah. are, are, are great. I'm going to make two comments. I think governments, I'm going to talk about the Canadian government here. I know there's an American podcast, <laughs> but the Canadian government needs to learn to, we don't always have to go through an academic person. I'm a professor of molecular medicine as well. I yeah. understand, but, but you should give a chance for a startup right. to run and control the money because we, we, we are so focused and have so much desire to prove ourselves, right? That I think that's a mistake. So we need that kind of support. Um, and then uh, the other point is, I think that we need to realize yeah. that our approach towards machine intelligence has been uh, overly focused on these techniques that have had success in computer vision. Yeah. And I think that there's a, uh, like creativity is going to play a major role in what's going to come. So we all have to understand it's still in its infancy, but some of some yeah. groups, I'm not alone. Some groups yeah. like we're, exp we're actually creating novel methods that can yeah. change things. Yeah. So I agree with you on all those points. Just a small correction. We're a global podcast. So we're going to have audience awesome. in Nigeria, in Israel, in Canada, in, in the U.S., and wherever else, because people have awesome. to hear that story. And, and that's the beauty of what we do, 
it doesn't have any license. I think that the innovation that you talk about can transform your own life personally, as well as those of your loved ones. And, and that's why I'm such a huge proponent of amplifying scientific innovation. So awesome. anyway, uh, my next question is, is there any technology or company that you're currently excited about? And it's okay to get your mind. I'm, I'm okay with that response too. <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I think I'm, I think, <laughs> well, you, you, okay, so I, I like this question a lot. So yes, I'm very excited about the crazy way just, a couple of weeks ago, we cracked open a deep neural network. We're actually starting to understand why it's making the choices that it's doing. I'm very excited about that. But forget about me, right? Okay, yada, yada. <laughs> but uh, no, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, you brought up one of the things, which was I'm impressed with the, you know, the immunotherapy stuff. Yes, but yes. Uh, so in addition to that, I think there's this company that I met. So I was a speaker at Longevity 2020. So I'm highly connected in the, um, in the aging space, right? The mm -hmm. longevity space. And there was a company that presented there and we just loved each other. And what they do is they, they're called uh, Nanots. Mm. They have this product mm. called Nano. So these are little nano, uh, these little nano vacuum cleaners. Mm. And what you do is they're, they're doing animal testing now and, and human probably take them another year or so to get there. But what's amazing about this technology is that basically there are these little orbs that are able to vacuum up um, problems like wow. molecular issues and so one of the ways i can help them is by identifying critical achilles heels right. and certain diseases and use these vacuums and on the other end there's this amazing idea that comes from the fact that what cancer does is it it usurps the reproductive machinery yes uh, yeah. that, that you know that you guys females used to to create you know offspring and so it uses this machinery and and so there's this amazing way that we might be able to deal with cancer in a few years through this. And I see so many things I can do with this technology. <laughs> so I'm really excited about, about these little nano, uh, nanots, these little vacuum cleaners. Yeah. I, I'm obsessed about nanotechnology. I think that that's one, an area of science and technology that is going to transform our lives in, in so many different aspects, starting with our health. So thank you for mentioning that. Um, and I sort of know what you might say, but uh, let me hear from you directly. H how would your advice for new biotech CEO be different today versus prior to COVID-19? Yeah, um, so there's first some hope, like the statistically companies that start during these uh, so COVID caused a recession for yeah. various reasons, right? And, and, and our markets are coming back and it's fine. Like, but uh, companies that start now, uh, I believe are going to be more successful because you're going to automatically have to be COVID proof, right? right? And also there's, there's another factor that I don't think we all understand that actually tends to have this, there's this pattern. Companies that start during recessions yeah. tend to be, yeah, okay. So, so one of the things that say is, uh, you know, the important, the most important thing is your team mm -hmm. and which is always true. Right. But there's something different now. It's like, you need to learn how to work when you're yeah. not a huddle together, yeah. not yeah. breathing down the throat. And you're going to have to very quickly evaluate who's working and who's not. <laughs> and, right. And have those metrics be very, very yeah. tight about it. And also uh, I would say that VCs, um, and angel investors in VCs, they have a different attitude now, right? Yeah. Things are tough for them too, in a sense. And they're gonna, they're gonna, they're still investing. I still get calls, uh, but it, you have to be prepared. Basically, it's like this: where when you were doing your pre-seed, you would have to have the preparedness of a seed round, and right. people who are doing seed would have to have the preparedness of a Series A, and right. so forth. That's the way. That's what's happened. I have to be like a Series A company now. Wow. Even though I'm just doing my seed. Right? Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, you know, I appreciate your honesty because I think our audience needs to know that it's how difficult it is to raise funding for, for what you do. And I think it's important for potential investors to also know that this is an area that people need to pay more attention to. So thank you yeah. for highlighting that. So my final question, the floor is completely yours. Any other commentary or thoughts? 
all the questions. I didn't, I didn't think about this one, but I'd, I'd say that, I mean, I'd take this opportunity to talk about my work a little bit, which is, you know, I think that my approach exemplifies uh, what has to happen with a lot of innovation that's coming down the pipe, which is we need to focus on something, some like aspects about, about complex diseases that are not going to be solved with the tools that are out there, mm-hmm. right? There's, there's a lot of great tools out there and a lot of great teams, but there's this, there's this um, overabundance of excitement about techniques that are just glorified data analytics. Yeah. And we, we need to humble, be humble and marry systems biology with machine learning, with mathematics. Uh, and, and I think, I think that if, if you're going to work on something and build a company, raise money, it has to be that you can't do it without that type of heavy organization. Right. Yeah. You have to, you have to, and you have to have that level of innovation or else it's, it's not worth it. There's so many companies doing the same thing. And, and, you know, I, I, I want people to, to be careful because and that's why there's so many failures in this space. Yeah. Right. You know, it, it, there is a way to succeed through this, but it's, yeah, it's tough. I mean, uh, what, what I'm highly interested in is it, we need, we need to change the way we think about, uh, patients like I one, one of the things I do a lot of is I help patients with critical illnesses like epilepsy and other rare diseases mm-hmm. uh, get help when they can't get help from the medical establishment the medical establishment looks at them and says here's the standard way of dealing with it and it doesn't always work yeah. right you need to have this openness and that's what I think this this mathematics and engineering perspective that we're bringing our programmers are bringing our mathematicians are bringing our systems biologists are bringing we're starting to understand that a, a person might have something wrong with them that doesn't fit the usual paradigm that has been established yeah. and we can't just say it's some functional disorder it's it's we there is the reason we call it precision medicine is precisely because there's precise differences between us and mm-hmm. and we need the tools to go in uh and and that's what i think i see it coming it's just it's so hard. COVID didn't help. <laughs> no, I like that. And, and I'm with you. And I honestly cannot think anyone better qualified, at least academically, to sort of push the field forward. And I know how frustrating it is when you are sitting at the forefront of innovation and the things that are not so innovative, not so new, are getting funded. But that's why I, I really appreciate you being on the podcast and, you know, sort of supporting that journey to amplify the innovation that is going on within uh, Naturomark. So thank you for, for joining me today. It's, I think uh, it's been fun talking to you. Um, uh, and I look forward to staying in touch. Awesome. Thank uh, you, Sophia. Thank you. Bye.